third sermon in this series, Myth Busters. But before we get into the sermon today, I want, is, does any, did anybody get their green card filled out? Uh, I want you to know, if you can pass those over to the center aisle, I'm going to have a couple of people come and pick those up. So pass those in to the middle. Uh, make sure that we get that. If you happen to fill one out through uh, the service, like when I'm preaching, if it gets boring kind of, you fill that out. Uh, make sure at the end just to run yours, give it to somebody and say, get that into the basket. Because this is a drawing for a free FPU class. We're starting small groups, our connect groups, in May. And this gives you a free membership. We think it's so important to see God's value on our money and on our possessions. That's going to be a great 10-week series. And you have an opportunity today, we're going to give away a free one. So it's kind of exciting. We're going to give it, it's, a, it's actually it's a $100 value, but we got such a deal on them. It's really now just a $70 value, but it's still a good deal. <laughs> so we'll draw those out. Somebody's going to be the blessed winner at the end of today. Secondly, on your way out, you're going to get a bag and a card. Because you are important to us. And we have our picture directory. Coming up this Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, we're going to have pictures taken so we can be in a directory, and you will get a free 8x10. Now, this series, Mythbusters, has to do with, you ever hear something and think, is that really true? And you know with these picture directories, this is true. There's not going to be any pressure to purchase other pictures. You're just going to get a free 8x10 and get in our directory. Now, that's really true. If it's not, we're going to fire those people. I didn't say that. Uh, but that they've given us our promise. We want you to be, there are so many people here. Wouldn't you, you see people probably every week or months, and you go, what's their name? You're going to be able to know their name because we're going to have a picture directory. If this is your first time with us today, or you've only been here two or three weeks, this is for you. Uh, get a free 8x10. Come get registered today. It's really important today that you hear this message that we want you standing in line getting registered. We have about half of our congregation registered and we want you to get registered. If you're not registered, we are going to give you a courtesy call Monday or Tuesday. And if you don't want to talk to us, register today on your way out. But you're going to get this card and here's what's cool. They have told us at Life Touch, you know, these are hard times. And uh, you can take this card and give it to your neighbor. Maybe there's a family that's down and out and, and, and they need a family photo. Free 8 by 10. Give them this. Get them registered. They can call the church office Monday and Tuesday and get registered. We have been doing it online, but we're going to just take the calls Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Go ahead and call anytime. Give that to them. I've already invited a family and uh, I'm not sure if they're signed up yet. But it's a great opportunity for outreach. And they don't have to be in our directory, so it's like, where's that person? You know. They don't have to do that. They can check that box. But it's a great opportunity just to touch somebody with, with a free gift. Very important. Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Get registered. I know I spent a lot of time with that, but we want to get you. We want to know who you are. Well, before we do that, just to illustrate how important that is, we have, I want to sit down. Glad I got my notes. And uh, we're going to have a skit to illustrate this picture directory stuff. So take one. Oh, hey, what's up? How are you doing? I'm doing great. What's going on with you? Oh, man. I can't remember her name. Was it Susie? <laughs> Is he married to that blonde guy with the two little kids? <sighs> no, that was the other guy. Oh, nuts. What's this guy's name? Maybe I can get my wife over here introduce herself. I'll try to bring my husband over here. Maybe he can get his name again. Oh, this is so embarrassing. I've talked to this guy at least 10 times. Don't let this happen to you. Sign up for your free church photo directory right after worship at the connecting point. Bonus, you get a free family 8 by 10. And remember, even if it's, it's your first time here, I know we have several first-time guests this morning. I'm trying to keep their names straight in my head, and, and we have Leo and Roy, and I, you know it just messes me up because you know you got to connect it. Get your get your picture taken, and help me. This is our third sermon in this series, MythBusters, 
And uh, I think this is kind of exciting series because there are perpetuated myths about Jesus and about the church. And when you hear it, you go, is that really true? And some of these myths really challenge our faith. And I hope through this series, we'll be able to debunk some of those myths so our faith will be encouraged and strengthened. We started out by talk, talking about how Jesus Christ is the one and only, the real thing. And he is. We believe for 2,000 years, nobody has been like Jesus. He's been the real thing to so many people's lives. Last week, we talked about how the myth is that some people say the church isn't for everybody. But you know what? The church is for everybody. And today, we're going to talk about this myth that is spoken that Christians should be seen and not heard. You know, nobody objects when Christians go out in the community and serve the community, or we come to church and we talk and we worship together by ourselves, or we assist families in need. You know, I spoke uh, about how this school, we went on Easter, we wanted to get information to all the school children that the Easter egg hunt was going to be here. And the superintendent's office said, no, I can't advertise that, you know, that one thing. And uh, last week, however, was the Hootenanny, the school fundraiser. And the Oasis, with a, a group of volunteer adults, with the youth group, we actually purchased and provided the food for their fundraiser to help the school out, and we cooked it and served it and cleaned up. And the, the principal here, Casey King, said, you know, we really appreciate you guys being here in the school. They really appreciated that. And the, the, the school loves it when we volunteer and when we communicate. Nobody objects when the church is serving and doing good things whether it's a fundraiser a PTA event maybe a sporting event but you know what when the church says can we get creationism taught alongside evolution in the church can we get abstinence education right alongside the sex education well whoa, whoa, whoa wait a minute wait just a minute religion is a private matter separation of church and state they say Christians should be seen and, and not really heard in school. And it's not only in the school system, the educational system, where you hear that. You hear that in the political arena as well. I mean, you, how many times have you heard lately, you know, separation of church and state? It's everywhere. You know, religion and politics, they don't mix. Christians should be seen but not heard in the political arena. And maybe you hear it in your place of employment as well. I mean, maybe your employer really appreciates the fact that you're a Christian, you got good work ethic, good work ethics, you're there on time, you're dependable, but if you speak up about your faith, maybe you've heard, well, you know what, business is business, and Christians should be seen and not really heard in the marketplace, you know. This is such a prevailing attitude that exists in our culture today, but it's nothing new. In fact, it's existed since the beginning of the church. In Acts chapter 4, at the beginning of the church, we read there about how Peter and John, they were arrested because they were very vocal in the community about their faith. I want to read a passage of scripture from, from the book of Acts chapter 4, beginning with verse 16. And the authorities said this about these guys who were very vocal about their faith. You know, what are we going to do with these men, they asked. These are the authorities in the land, really, the religious authorities. Everybody living in Jerusalem knows that they have done an outstanding miracle. And we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn these men to speak no longer to anyone in this name of Jesus. Then they called the men again and commanded them not to speak or to teach at all. In the name of Jesus. But Peter and John said, Judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. Christians have always been discouraged from speaking up about their faith from the very beginning of the church whether it's a public arena, school arena, business arena, private arena, because Christians, for whatever reason, they possess this threat, pose this threat to the community at large. It's just this perceived, fabricated threat. Well, in Matthew chapter 13, we're looking through some of the parables of Jesus. And in Matthew chapter 13, if you want to t uh, turn there, we're going to look at two parables today about the kingdom of God. 
And they, I think, reveal that Christians should be seen and they should be heard. And it's a myth that Christians are to be passive and should never attempt to influence their culture. So we're going to look at both of these parables because I think they demonstrate what the Lord intends for His church. To grow and to be, make a vital impact on the culture around them. So first, let's look at the parable of the mustard seed. In chapter 13, the mustard seed naturally grows to be a very large plant. It's one of the tiniest of seeds. If you, if you put it on the tip of your finger, it would appear to be a speck. I once saw in a Christian bookstore uh, something like this. It was a mustard seed behind a magnifying glass. And it kind of illustrates how small that is. And the seed grows to be such a very large plant. Jesus described it as a tree sometimes growing up to 15 feet tall. So they can get very large, a tree light just from the very beginning of a seed. And that's what Jesus is talking about in this parable. And in verse 31 of chapter 13, we read this, that Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all your seeds, yet when it grows, it's the largest of, garden, of the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. That tiny seed grows into a huge tree. That's the obvious meaning, that the people in Jesus' culture, his hearers of that day, they would have understand that is the obvious meaning. But we're looking at these parables, and the parables of Jesus have double meanings. They have a deeper spiritual truth that Jesus is shining the light on and revealing throughout these parables. And Jesus is teaching that to his hearers that, hey, the kingdom of God, it starts small, but it's going to get really big. It's going to be very influential. And this parable has several applications, I think, that we can pull from that spiritually. The mustard seed, I think, illustrates the influence of Jesus Christ. He was born in obscurity. And by the time he was 33 years old, the whole world knew about, they were talking about Jesus. And after Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, he had such a following at that time, the leaders began to plot to kill him because he was a threat to the establishment. In Matthew 12, 19, these authorities say, look how the whole world has gone after him. So Jesus grew to this place in influence where all of these follows, followers were seeking the security of what he had to offer, eternal life. Well, another application, I think, also illustrates the growth of the early church, illustrated in this mustard seed concept. Where do you go when you want to find out the history of the church? The book of Acts and the Bible. You go to the book of Acts, thank you. And in the first chapter, we read that Jesus' followers about that time was about a group of 120 people, that's smaller than a group of people that we have here. And soon after that, on this particular day when the first gospel sermon was preached, it says that 3,000 people were baptized and became believers that day. We're trying to figure out how to disciple 200 people here in this church. And they had to figure out, I mean, these 12 guys had to figure out how to disciple 3,000 that first day. I mean, they had to have baptizers elbow by the end of that night. But they had to be astounded by the explosive growth of the church. And it was so exciting that God recorded that in the history, in the Bible that we have today. We're going to look at some of those verses. In Acts 2, it says, The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. That's how fast it grew. Acts 4.4, 4, Many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. That's just the men. Acts chapter 5, More and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. Acts 6, the word of God spread, and the number of disciples grew, increased rapidly. In Acts 8, the world, the, the establishment of the day, felt so threatened by these do-gooders that they started attacking people physically. The persecution of the church, it's talked about in Acts 8. And all these Christians were pushed out to the surrounding lands. And the church started to grow in Ethiopia, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. Paul took, in chapter 17 of the book of Acts, went to Thessalonica, 
And it said there that many Greeks, many Greeks and prominent women were converted. And Acts chapter 17 verse 6 says that the religious establishment were so jealous that they mounted an opposition against the church and they dragged some of these church leaders before their city councils. In Acts 17 verse 6 we read, These men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here. And I want to pause just a minute to give a parenthetical statement here. When I look at that statement, they've caused trouble. I try to think, what did that mean back in the first century? Because this was a group of people that were doing good wherever they went. They were helping communities. They were assisting in all ways. They were kind. They were nonviolent people. But they caused trouble according to those who were running the cities and who were in power and who were in authority. It was as political back in the first century, I want to tell you, as it is today in our culture. I see some accusations against various groups of people in our culture and one in particular that I've read about as causing trouble in holding their rallies are a group of what I've learned to be nonviolent people and they're, they're called the, the Tea Party. And I, I look at that Tea Party and what I've learned about them and reading about them in juxtaposition against some of the other people that are having rallies in our country today who are smashing out window fronts, who are causing trouble, who are getting arrested. And some of those groups in the news, they're not known or being called troublemakers like this Tea Party group has been called. And you know, I wonder if it's because of the political agreement or disagreement and the excuses made for this ill behavior of these people. And I think about in the first century, you know what, it's just like it was today. Christians or do-gooders can be seen as people as causing trouble. Why is that? We'll get into that in another sermon. But this mustard seed grew the church and it grew so quickly all over the world and the establishment was a little bit threatened by that. But I think this parable also illustrates the purpose of this church, the oasis. You know, we're, we're doing a picture directory so we can know each other because we're growing. And uh, we had a humble beginning, like the mustard seed. I mean, the visionary, Michael Gray, the founding minister of this church, had the vision, just a few families started meeting together and had the vision of transforming Pueblo West, and that's what we're about still today. And Michael and Nancy still have that vision that they're going to go uh, across the world to spread that seed as well. Because that tiny seed grows up and has such an influence. It becomes one of the largest plants. You know, I spoke with a family recently that's been attending here, and they said, you know, we were just looking for a church home. But what we've really found at the Oasis is we've found family. And, you know, you've got to consider how many families have come to know Jesus Christ here in this place? How many divorces, how many affairs, how many suicides perhaps have been prevented because of the teaching and influence of Jesus Christ here? How much joy and contentment have people come and sought here in the branches of this church? A lot of people have come and found refuge in the branches of what was just this small tiny mustard seed at one point. And I think this parable refutes the idea that the church shouldn't grow to be too big. I mean, people say, well, you know what, I just don't like a big church. I read about three common objections to a church growing too big. And one objection is this. You know, people say, you know, we shouldn't grow too big because we need to emphasize quality over quantity. Well, quality and quantity aren't exclusively mutual. I mean, evangelizing Pueblo West and teaching and growing deep with the members of the church right now, that's not mutually exclusive. It goes hand in hand. I mean, in, a, in, a, in an athletic concept, in that sphere, we don't say, let's put a quality team on the, on the floor so we can have fewer fans. No, quality begets quantity. Or in the restaurant, well, let's not have the best food that we can have so we can have fewer customers. No, quality begets 
growth. That's just natural. And with the church, the more quantity, the more quality, it goes hand in hand, the more that we'll be able to grow together and have teachers and be able to do and grow and do all kinds of things in our community. Another objection to the church growing too big as you know, we really want to have a friendly church. And the assumption is a big church can't be friendly. It's too impersonal. But if any church, unless it's really located in some remote area, if it remains small, well, you got to think, why is it remaining so small? If small churches are so friendly, why do so many of them remain small? Well, it's because they're friendly with each other, aren't they? And if you go in as a visitor, you feel like you're walking in on a family reunion because you're just a visitor in that. I think one of the benefits of being a part of a growing congregation is there are a lot of people looking for the same thing. They're looking for a relationship with Christ. They're looking with a relationship with other people. And you know, you might have to work a little bit harder to register for a connect group, to go to Dave Ramsey or to join a ministry team. But once you do that, there's such refuge in a place that's growing and moving and fulfilling the Lord's commandment. Another objection to the church growing too large is that, you know what? God isn't interested in numbers. Well, that sounds kind of right. But it sounds kind of pious, too. You know, God's always been interested in numbers. I mean, we're, we read about the book of Acts. They wrote 120. They wrote 3,000. God wrote 5,000. There were 12 disciples. There are numbers all throughout the world. God even says that he has the hairs on our head numbered. That doesn't help some people a whole lot. <laughs> Just caught that there. Yeah. Jesus taught about uh, this fold of sheep. You know, if you have 100 sheep and... and One's missing and there's only 99. Who wouldn't go out and rescue that one lost sheep? Well, a lazy shepherd would go, eh, that looks like 100, and he'd go to bed. But a concerned shepherd would take the time to count and discover that lost sheep. I mean, what if we decided, well, numbers don't really matter to God, and so you know what? We're not going to count the offering anymore. We're just not going to pay our bills. We're not going to reconcile our statement. We're not going to post in our bulletin how much money that, that the offerings brought in, what kind of work that we're doing. Well, some might say, that's ridiculous. That's poor stewardship. Why is that? Well, because numbers count when it comes to paying the bills, paying the offering, and giving God. Well, which is most important? Money or souls? So we count people because people count and people matter to God. The Lord intends for His church to grow and counting is the only way that we can find out if we're fulfilling our mission here at the Oasis Christian Church that we're trying to connect people to Jesus and to, to each other. Christians may think, well, if the church is too big, it's going to be impersonal. Or the world may think, oh, the church is getting too big, it's going to be a threat to us. But those people who find refuge here understand the inspiration and the security that the church offers in this parable of the mustard seed. Well, let's look at the parable of the yeast next. In Matthew chapter 13, the yeast permeates the entire loaf. I, when I was 16 years old, I worked at Rocky Sub Pub Pizza and I became the head pizza cook. I think that's what we're called. And uh, we actually made our dough uh, from scratch. We used yeast, and, and we'd mix that together, and it, it was, it was, it was kind of neat, and this big batch of dough, and we'd roll out these patties, and we'd let those patties, patties uh, set, and they would just kind of grow a little bit, and you could take that dough then and, and make your crust. And now uh, this is the best example of yeast that I found. Uh, <laughs> Krispy Kreme donuts, you know, you got to love the Krispy Kreme donut. But I think it's about, you know, it adds everything to this poor thing of dough, you know. Uh, yeast in the Bible is usually illustrated uh, to demonstrate the effects of sin. This is one of the few occasions in Scripture that it has a positive influence or a positive application that the yeast permeates the dough and makes it better. 
But I think that Jesus is illustrating here that Christians should have a positive impact on the culture as it infiltrates and permeates the culture. So in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13, with verse 33, we read about this parable. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all through the dough. Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. So was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. So the obvious meaning that Jesus' hear, hearers would have understood is that yeast adds flavor. There's something about the oxygen that mixes with the dough that makes leavened bread taste better than unleavened bread. Now that's the obvious meaning. The, the spiritual, the deeper meaning is that the church, Christians, should add flavor and joy to every aspect of life. Another obvious meaning is that yeast is seldom noticed. You know, after you eat a piece of homemade bread, do, do you say, boy, that's the best yeast I've ever eaten? No, you say it's, it's, it's the best bread because you, you don't taste the yeast. And the spiritual application is that the influence of the church and Christians in society often go unnoticed. But we're only effective when we permeate the loaf. You know, yeast, if it stays in the packet, it's not really going to be of any value. And Christians just gathering on Sunday for worship aren't really going to be any value as Christ intended for our influence to be on our culture. We are to permeate and to make a difference. Another obvious meaning is that yeast is alive. Randy Glotch of our church had a small group of people over uh, talking about food storage. And hopefully in our fall semester of Connect Groups in October, we're going to have that offered as, as a Connect Group. And uh, he talked about how yeast doesn't have that long of a shelf life because it's alive. You know, it's been described as a, as a fungus, actually, as well. But it makes bread tasty. That's the obvious meaning. The underlying meaning Jesus is talking about is the church and Christians bring vitality and eternal life to those who we come into contact with because we are alive. The only one preaching this message of eternal life like we do. And this parable refutes the idea that Christians should just be seen and not heard. I mean, Christians are supposed to permeate the world and make a positive difference. I did a funeral of a good friend of mine years ago. He was 42 years old when he fell over with a heart attack and died. And you didn't, you didn't need to... If you met Jeff within the first few minutes, you'd know three things about him immediately you would know that he was a University of Kentucky basketball fan. You knew he loved to hunt, and you knew he loved his church. And he preached his funeral, and there were people that came up that worked with Jeff, knew Jeff from the community, that said, you know what? They never met the guy without him inviting them to church. That's the vitality that Jeff brought to life. He made such a positive difference, like yeast would, in any community. So as Christians, we make no apology about going out and being seen and heard, about promoting the message of Jesus Christ in our community. I mean, Jesus said, be the salt of the earth. Add flavor to it. Be the light of the world. Shine on this darkness. You're to be the yeast in the loaf. Bring life to it. Make a difference. Go preach to all nations, he said. But have you ever wondered... Have you ever wondered why it is that church people seem to be the only people that have a message that nobody wants to hear? I mean, you ever think about that? Advertisers can have commercials on about safe sex, but you have a commercial about abortion, and they crawl out of the woodwork and say, Whoa, wait, that's too controversial to play on television, guys. Animal activists such as PETA, they are carnivores when it comes to getting their message across. I mean, they even have half-dressed models in cages. And nobody says, well, you shouldn't do that. 
There are race groups like the new Black Panther Party. I mean, I read that they had a bounty on this guy's head in Florida, dead or alive. I didn't hear anybody wanting to arrest them. In fact, I heard on one news program that they said this about that bounty on this guy's head about the new Black Panther Party. Well, nobody takes them seriously. Seriously? All kinds of groups that are out there getting them right. Freedom of speech, First Amendment rights, you know, but Christians speak up. Wait. Separation. Can't do that. It's a violation. Don't impose your values on us. How clever. 2,000 years worth of clever. But we can't be quiet. We know what it means to know the Lord. And we know that we have a message of eternal life. I mean, if you knew a building was burning and there was a group of people down there and they didn't know it, you'd do everything you could to get those people out of that building. Whether they believe the building was on fire or not, we have the message of eternal life. And there is condemnation eternally for those of, who do not believe and follow Jesus Christ as a real thing. And we've got to speak up because if we don't do it, nobody will. Because we are the church. We stand for Jesus Christ and His message. We stand for it and we alone. That's why the whole world gets so upset when we're talking about it. Because the devil has been described as the prince of this world. Well, thirdly, let's look at the earthly stories with a heavenly meaning. You know, there are two applications that I want to leave with you today. Uh, when it comes to the church and Christians and how we are to act in growing Christ's kingdom. I think there's two essential components in thinking about the seed and the yeast. And one is we've got to have that visual witness with integrity. That visual witness with integrity. I mean, you ever see the, like the Grammys? I remember flipping through and seeing the Grammys. People get up and go, oh, I thank my mom. I thank my, my, my roadies. I thank my band. They thank every. I thank Jesus Christ. And it's kind of cool when somebody says, I thank Jesus Christ. But haven't you ever seen anybody like at an award show? And they've got this vulgar music and they're dressed immodestly. And they get up and say, oh, I thank Jesus Christ for my music. And you think, you know, there's a little disconnect between the Jesus that I know so there needs to be this visual witness, this life of integrity before really that we have a, before we gain a right to be heard. First Peter says this, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God. Because there's, there's got to be this life of integrity to follow with that. So that's an essential component. Of being a seed and yeast is you have that life of integrity. Second component, I think that's essential to being the seed and the yeast, is this verbal testimony with tact. Christ's kingdom grows when there's this combination of a visual testimony with integrity and a verbal witness, a verbal testimony with tact. It's like a post hole digger. You've got to have two, two posts on a post hole digger to pull that dirt out. And that's kind of the way it is with the message and what we say, our life and what we say. Matthew, Jesus said this, Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand. And it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. So there's got to be a good deed and the visual witness. And you know what? When you do a good deed, what do people do? They thank you. You know, you see somebody standing on the side of the road and they're stranded and you go, you help them, you spend a half hour of your time and they go, thank you. And you get in your car and you drive off. Well, they've just thanked you. They've not given any glory to God. How do we turn that occasion into an occasion where you're giving glory to God? Well, you say, you know what, I stopped. I probably wouldn't have done that, but you know what, I'm, I, I love God and we're supposed to be kind to our neighbors. And that's part of the reason why I'm stopping here because, you know, I just want to help you out. Or you say, you know what, I want to invite you to church. And then they go, ah, you know, there's something to this God thing. And you know, we need to do that. We need that positive witness that's tactful. Now, there's some people that have such a hard time doing that. They just drive off after somebody said, thank you. And you know, there's other people that would maybe get tongue-tied 
And they'd go, well, I've got to be a Christian witness. And they say, thank you. And they say, well, you know what? I, I really stopped because I really wanted to tell you that you're going to go to hell if you don't believe in Jesus. You know, but that's what people remember. That's what Christians get tagged with. That's what the church gets known for, those obnoxious Christians. Because they remember that kind of stuff when we flub up a little bit. But there are, there are obnoxious preachers. I mean, I heard about a guy in Cincinnati, a preacher, preached the gospel. And, and I was told this true story that, that one of the guys came up and he, he held their hand and took out a Bic lighter and, and struck it and burned their hand and said, that's what hell's going to be like if you don't repent. Now, you know what? That might be true. <laughs> but it's, it's kind of obnoxious a little bit. But I think about myself and I wonder, I wonder how many times... I've been obnoxious with the message, and I've been condemning, I've been condescending, I've been pious, and I wonder how many people that perhaps I've turned away because I've not been really as tactful as I could and should have been. We've got to have the, the visual witness with that verbal testimony. First Peter reads, in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. That's the verbal testimony. What's Christ done in my life? Do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against you, because they're going to do it, against your good behavior in Christ, may be ashamed of their slander. They're going to do it, but don't give them anything to bite on. God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble, and so do people for the most part. So how does Christ's kingdom get perpetuated in the world as a mustard seed and as yeast? It's through his church. It's through individual Christians who seek to go out and to make a difference with their family, with their co-workers, and with their friends. But the difficulty is, and I want you to get this, some Christians want to be just seen and not heard. They say, I want to be the silent witness. I'm afraid for somebody to ask me a question. I'm not very vocal about my faith. I think another reason that they remain silent is because they bought into this. They've been programmed to really believe Christians should be seen and not heard. And they really believe that, you know what, faith is a private matter. I don't think I should share my faith. I like the response that Peter gave when he was confronted about not speaking up when he said this as we open with judge for yourselves whether it's right in God's sight to obey you rather than God for we cannot help but speaking about what we've seen and what we've heard even when we live in a culture like the first century that was dismissive about the message of Jesus Christ we've got to speak up we cannot remain silent no matter the consequences because if you don't do it, who will? I was given a book last week entitled The Political Imperative, An Assignment from God. This guy, Norm Mason, preacher turned politician, in that he, he highlighted the three sacred institutions that God has bestowed upon all the peoples of the earth. There's three there's three God-ordained God -ordained institutions. One's the family, one's the church, and one is civil government. All throughout scriptures, God has relied upon those three institutions to perpetuate his message in an orderly society. But he is illustrated in those three institutions of how we acquiesced in the political arena. Yeah, we know what it, like, what it means to be a good family person. We know what it likes to be, to be a good member of a church. But we've kind of relinquished that concept that we should influence our civil government. But Norm Mason writes this, Political activity, specifically that which arises out of our Christian faith, has certainly received a mixed reception in the churches today. And he says, you know what? There are some Christians that are really political activists. And he said there are some who think being involved in the political process is good, but it's not really on par with real church work. And he says there's some who are just repulsive, thinks there shouldn't be a Christian involved 
with politics whatsoever. But he says this, understanding the role and purpose of civil government and our political imperative leads us to seek the proper biblical based response to become the Great Commission citizen. It's imperative for Christ's kingdom to flourish in all spheres of life, in the family, in the church, and the civil discourse as well. Matthew said this, whoever, Jesus said, whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. Whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him before my Father in heaven. Would you pray with me? Father, you have illustrated so much to us in keeping the scriptures pure to communicate your will for mankind. I pray that we would understand the import of your parables, the deeper meaning that you wanted to convey and to relay about the church and about your people, that we are to permeate and grow like never before, especially in those three spheres. And I pray, Father, we know we're going to face opposition in that. It's nothing new. I pray that we can understand that the trouble the world calls us, you would call it eternal life. I pray today, O oh Lord, th these are some heavy hitting parables, I think, that you've given to us that, that really challenges my faith and how I act and move in the world. And I pray that we would open our eyes and ears as you've called us to do to hear your message. And I know there are to, those here today, Lord, that are very new in understanding you. I pray that they will have heard what you need to communicate with them. If they should want to respond, to join your church, to be baptized, to make a decision, to pray, that they would be bold today to do that. In fact, would you guys repeat with me, if you really believe it, that I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and I receive Him as my Lord and Savior. Father, I pray that anyone who said that today, who has not taken the next steps, or that they need to repent, that they would do that today, that you would motivate them to get up out of their seat, that they would meet one of our leaders in the back and pray or instruct them on the next steps, that we would walk with them every step of the way. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.